just what is the largest man-made object to ever move? What's the largest ship ever built? The largest shipwreck to ever happen? The largest salvage operation in human history? The largest ship sunk in a war? The largest ship sunk ever? What ship is the longest and heaviest ever built? The largest ship to ever be scrapped? What if I told you all those amazing numbers, those amazing things are the same ship? The biggest, the heaviest, the most outrageous ship to ever sail the seas. This week on History Sea, the story of the Seawise Giant. We humans have built a lot of huge stuff. The Empire State Building, the pyramids, the airships, the Pentagon. But when it comes to the largest ship ever built and sailed, there's one ship to hold all the titles, to rule the seas, and she had one heck of a life. Today I'm going to tell you the story of the Seawise Giant. In the 1970s, oil transportation was a huge deal. The automobile had taken over the world by storm, and the industrial enterprise of human civilization was bigger than it had ever been. Countries had built the greatest armies ever known to man, and it was all largely powered by oil. And moving oil from the Middle East to the furthest reaches of the planet was huge business, and the only way to do it was by water, so the oil tanker ships got bigger and bigger. Records were being set constantly for the longest, the heaviest, the fastest, and who could move the most oil in one trip. One such oil moving company from Greece commissioned a ship bigger than anything before her, and they got the Sumitomo Heavy Industries Company in Japan to do the building. She would be Colossal, over 1,500 feet long, longer than the Empire State Building is tall. And her carry weight was something no one had ever dreamt of, some 550,000 tons, or more than 40 Brooklyn bridges in her cargo hold. The goal was not to sail quickly, but to carry more than anyone had ever dreamt of from point A to point B. And the ship was finished, and immediately there was a problem. On the sea trials, where they take the ship to test it out in the ocean, she had a horrible vibration whenever they went in reverse. Something wasn't right, and although they had spent millions and millions of dollars building her, the company that ordered her refused to take delivery because of that problem, and the case went to the courts, and ultimately another company agreed to buy her, the Orient Overseas Container Line. But when they bought her, they decided that she wasn't quite big enough, so they did what they call jumboization. And I didn't make that word up. It's a real thing. Basically what they do is they cut the brand spanking new ship in half and then they stick another section in the middle and put it all back together. The new section is an exact replica of the existing ship's middle bit. So essentially it just makes the ship however much longer that they want to make her. Now she was unveiled to the world over twice the length of the Titanic with 46 oil tanks for her cargo, and now over 650 tons. The greatest ship, the greatest moving man-made object ever dreamt, dreamt up, and it had been constructed. To give you an idea of the size of her deck, for example, it's almost exactly the same size as the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool in Washington. Yeah, that one. The propeller was over 50 tons by itself, some 30 feet across, and the rudder to steer the ship was a goliath weighing some 230 tons. That's more than an H4 Hercules flying boat. That's heavy. The vastness of this ship is hard for me to overstate. For another comparison, we can look at the USS Nimitz, which was built around the same time. She was one of the largest and most powerful warships ever made. She's nuclear powered, and as an aircraft carrier, her size is immense. But she falls 500 feet shy of the Seawise Giant. And the draft, how much water it takes for the ship to float and not hit the bottom. The Nimitz needs a little bit less than 40 feet of water, which is huge. The Seawise Giant 
more than 80, 80 feet deep, which really puts a damper on where she can go in the world, and only arriving really in the deepest of harbors, and that 650,000 ton displacement, six times the Nimitz, six. Power on the Seawise Giant came from two boilers, supplying the prop with some 50,000 horsepower, which I mean, it sounds like a lot, but her cruising speed was just 16 knots. But that's okay. Her purpose wasn't to be fast or race across the ocean. It was to be efficient. She might take a little longer to get across the ocean, but when she arrived, she'd bring more oil with her than the last three ships that came in front of her. And all that weight and size came at a price in terms of, of course, maneuverability. From full chat, if you wanted to stop her, the runway better be at least six miles long. Six miles to come to a stop. And turning around, forget about it. Not unless you have at least two miles of open ocean beside you of at least 80 feet deep. Histercy is a newer channel, and I really appreciate the support from you all. Please take a second to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. Both of those things are free for you, and they would really mean the world to me. So we have the greatest ship ever built, and she was making regular passes between the Middle East and the U.S., hauling oil, and everything was good until it wasn't, and a war broke out in the 1980s, the Iran-Iraq War. The Iran-Iraq War was a major conflict that took place from 1980 to 1988. It was one of the longest and deadliest wars of the 20th century, resulting in significant casualties, over a million people, and long-lasting geopolitical consequences for the Middle East. The war began on September 22, 1980, when Iraq, led by President Saddam Hussein, launched a full-scale military invasion into Iran. The primary cause of the war was sort of a combination of territorial disputes, religious differences, and power struggles between the two countries. Iraq was concerned about Iran's Islamic rev revolution, fearing that it might inspire Shiite Muslims within Iraq to rise up against Saddam Hussein and his Sunni-dominated government. Additionally, Iraq sought to gain control of the Shat al-Arab waterway and the oil-rich Kazakhstan province in southwestern Iran. They wanted the oil. Now, of course, this was really none of the Seawise Giant's business. She was just a cargo ship running oil back and forth across the world's ocean, and she wasn't owned or operated by either Iran or Iraq, but she found herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. She found herself anchored off the shore of Iran, and her job for the moment was to just sit there and be an oil supply depot for other smaller tankers. And the Spanish ship Barcelona had pulled up to the giant and was transferring oil from one to the other. And on May 14, 1988, she became a target. Iraq had just sent fighter bombers into Iran on an attack run, and history is unclear what happened next and actually made everything go wrong, but whether or not it was Saddam who ordered this, the aircraft that were sent from Iraq started attacking the ships in the harbor off Iran's coast. Five ships in total, all tankers, and of course the Seawise Giant was a very easy target for aircraft. The bombs fell, and the first victim was the Barcelona. She took many hits and erupted in flames, slowly starting to list. Three nearby ships were hit too, but would survive the ordeal, unlike the Barcelona and the Seawise Giant, both full of oil and now engulfed in flames. It took two full days for the Barcelona to list over enough to begin to sink. The Seawise Giant would meet its fate shortly after, as she was swept beneath the waves, presumably lost forever. The war between Iran and Iraq actually drew to a stalemate a few months later, and a peace was negotiated. And while the owners of the giant had completely written her off, her wreckage was actually sold to Norman International. And Norman never published records of how they did this, but they managed to refloat the giant. We can make some assumptions here. The ship was far too vast for cranes or any sort of lifting, but we had the technology existing to fill airbags up. You stick the airbags inside the ship and you pump them full of oxygen. We still use that technology today. And she was ultimately refloated and towed to Singapore, one of the few places in the world where you could actually fit that ship for repairs. 
and repairs were made at great expense to make her seaworthy again, and with salvage complete, she was renamed from Seawise Giant to Happy Giant, which I guess is kind of fitting after someone saves you from the depths of the salt and fixes you up so you can float again. Once fixed, she was put up for sale and someone bought her a shipping titan named Jorgen Jar for 75 million in today's cash, and he named her the Jar Viking. And she was again put to work running cargo all over the world until 2024 when she was sold again, this time to Olsen Tankers, and they renamed her too. This time, the biggest ship in the world would sail as the Nock Nevis. Now, being the greatest, heaviest, and biggest oil tanker in the world was pretty big business in the 80s and 90s, but the world was changing. Oil prices didn't have stability anymore, and Olsen never knew if the ship would even make money anymore. There are records of oil tankers at the time filling up with oil in one country and then driving deliberately slowly across the ocean, hoping by the time that they got to where they were going, the price of oil would have gone up, making the trip worth actually making. It was hard times for a global super tanker, and eventually she became too costly to keep running. So they turned her into a floating oil warehouse to store oil in, and they just anchored her in the Persian Gulf. And there she sat for a while until finally it was time to scrap her. The biggest ship ever built had to be scrapped. And to scrap such a behemoth, we have to talk about Alang in India. Alang is located in the state of Gujarat in India. It's one of the world's largest ship breaking yards. Ship scrapping in Alang involves the dismantling and recycling of these decommissioned ships, including tankers and cargo vessels and all other types of ships that have reached the end of their operational lives. The process of ship scrapping in Alang typically, typically begins when a ship is brought to the beach by tugboats and intentionally run aground at high tide. The ship breaking yards in Alang are situated along the coastline that gives them easy access to those ships. And once the ship is beached, the dismantling process begins. Ship scrapping in Alang involves a labor intensive and very hazardous process. The workers, known as ship breakers, manually dismantle the ships using hand tools and blow torches and cranes and sledgehammers. They systematically cut the ship into smaller pieces, and then further, those pieces are broken down for recycling. The materials recovered from ship breaking include steel and iron and non-ferrous metals and various other components. The ship breaking industry in Alang has faced a lot of scrutiny over the years due to environmental concerns, labor concerns, safety measures, and working conditions have improved in recent years, but challenges remain. Workers often face hazardous working conditions, including exposure to toxic substances, heavy machinery risks, inadequate protection equipment. These efforts are being made to enhance safety standards and worker welfare, but there's a long way to go. Environmental concerns are also a pretty significant issue with the process. Ship breaking involves the handling of hazardous materials such as asbestos, PCBs, and heavy metals. In the past, ship breaking practices in Alang raised concerns about pollution and improper disposal of hazardous waste. Where are they putting all this stuff? But now there are some stricter regulations and international standards have been implemented to sort of address these issues, aiming to ensure proper waste management and environmental protection. The Nock Nevis, the Happy Giant, the Seawise Giant, now just called the Mont, was run to a land and steamed up at high tide onto the beach with all her might and run aground. And then the ship breakers took over. Usually a big tanker like this takes a few months. And you can't tell it's even a ship anymore after those couple of months. But the giant took over a year and employed 18,000 full-time workers as they tore her down to her keel. The Seawise Giant represents more than just a ship of colossal size and what's possible when human beings put everything they know into a mega project like this. It also represents a world of the past where shipping oil across the oceans was one of the biggest businesses we'd ever seen on the planet Earth as we divided up natural resources and fought over them and ultimately moving forward in technology, leaving behind these massive structures and their history 
in our wake. Will there ever be another tanker this big? The answer is very likely no. Will there ever be another ship this big? The answer is also likely no. Her 1,500 foot, 650,000 ton stats are likely never to be challenged. Even right now, the biggest cruise ships even being planned or dreamt up are 1,100, 1,200 feet, 250,000 tons. They're still 400 feet shy of what the Sea Wise Giant was. We'll probably never see anything like it again. History Sea is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks a month to make these videos possible. If you want to help me keep making videos, please consider becoming a patron. And please let me know in the comments what you want to see in the next Maritime History episode here on History Sea. Until then, I will see you next week.